Welcome to Infinite Fellowship Ministries where we train believers to know and to pursue God's perfect will so as to yield fruit for His kingdom. Here is a sermon by Bishop Kobanga J.O. It's good. It's, uh, fatherhood is a, is, is a very, very important uh, uh, privilege that we have in God, both biologically and spiritually, and it is something we should not take for granted. Um, and I, you, you realize from time to time I keep on emphasizing on the importance of uh, those of us whose dads are still alive. You better celebrate them. By the way, it doesn't matter if your father is a sorcerer. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay. Don't tell me my dad is a sorcerer and therefore my money will not go to sorcery. You are a fool. <laughs> even if your dad is a sorcerer, even if he's a drunkard, even if he's whatever you call him, he is your father. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't matter what he has said. It, it doesn't matter even if he pronounced a curse on you. Yeah, hey. that's true. The best way of reversing curses from a parent is, is by you, number one, loving them and respecting them. You're getting me? Yes. Huh? Yes. Because, you see, there's no difference between you and your own father who pronounced a curse on you when you start hating. I mean, what? I mean, that's not being a believer. Yes. Okay? The fact that you dishonor that man, that just shows that you have a problem. Now, I know the African father is, a, is, is the most difficult father, I think. All right? I also have one. Uh, Gobanga Senior is, is not easy to deal with. I think uh, out of all my siblings, I'm the only person who's able to handle him well and get what I want. I'm one person who can do things and get away where my father is concerned. The rest cannot. Maybe because of the fact that we are of the same personality type. But the truth is this. I respect my father. Because of who he is. He brought me up. He taught me the ways of life. He made very many mistakes. And he also scored a lot of uh, successes. Okay? You hearing me? Oh, yeah. I don't know about you, but I celebrate my own dad very much. Yeah. If I hated him the way people hate their fathers, and, uh, and you can imagine having lost my mother last year, I don't even know how life would have been. But I celebrate him, and that's why I'm charging those of you whose fathers are alive, celebrate him. Yeah. I'm not saying that you become a partake of anything that is wrong that your father does. Okay? Just celebrate him and respect him. Don't even go into many details. For those whose fathers are deceased, don't tell me that now that my dad is no more, I can do whatever I want. I'm not under any authority. You can find an uncle that you probably respect, either from your dad's side or from your mother's side. Or if there's a family friend, probably a, a, a man who was, who, whom you can actually regard as a father figure, a mentor that was close to your parents. Or if you can't find that, then identify someone in the society that you can actually tell that this is an individual who has your best interests. That's very important. Yeah, yeah. Okay? You're getting me? Yeah. You know, as a as a pastor, yes, there are blessings that I can confer on you. That is true. But remember, the blessings that I confer on you are only spiritual. They have nothing to do with your natural heritage. And that is where your fathers come in. If he is there, that is different. Just identify somebody. Don't tell me that because your father has failed in, in his life, you now look, you, you look for a replacement. My friend, you are a fool if you do that. 
Respect your dad. Respect your dad. Love your father. Not because he's perfect, but because he's your father. If your mother is alive, celebrate your mother. Okay? There are those of you who have challenges relating with your mothers, but the truth of the matter is you must celebrate your mother. There is also a blessing that comes from a mother. There is. There is a blessing that only a mother can give that a father cannot give. Just as there is a blessing that a father can give that a mother cannot give. Now watch this. A father can actually nullify a curse pronounced by a mother. I will share a mystery. I'm going to share, I'm going to, I'm going to do a series, if not this year, maybe next year, because I don't think you're even ready for this. I'll teach you about the mystery of parental blessing, and I'll show you how it is possible for a father to cancel any pronunciation that is negative coming from your mother. But a mother cannot nullify a curse from a father. Now, this is not to mean that mothers are subordinate to fathers. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to show you that. You, you, because, you see, the devil always fights fatherhood. Because fatherhood is where there is inheritance. And the enemy knows very well that when we align ourselves with our fathers or our father figures, we will definitely get inheritance. So what happens is, he stirs up a certain spirit in you that makes you begin to prefer your mother more than your father. And you know, African mothers specialize in manipulating sons, especially. And it's not good. So as a son, do not allow yourself to fall into that trap of being manipulated by a mother. But respect her. Just respect her, love her, draw the line. Okay? Mm. You get what I'm saying? Yes. These are things that will help you. Don't try to be like people in the West who are very selective when it comes to parental honor. Okay? Yeah. Now, I know somebody saying, but Bishop, you know what my father did uh, when I was 14? It's true that your father did things, but the truth of the matter is that you must respect him. You must understand that the environment in which your dad grew up is different from yours. You are more enlightened. So for you, it will be required more than your father. You get what I'm saying, guys? Yes. You know, one of the things that will happen when judgment comes, let me surprise you. One of the things that will happen when judgment comes, eh? or rather when we religiously referred to as Judgment Day. The people you judged harshly, you might find that they are more justified than you. Wow. Wow. The people that you keep pointing fingers at, because you use yourself as a yardstick, yep. those are the ones that will be more justified than you. Okay? You know, Jesus put it in a simple way, judge not that, uh, lest he be judged. The measure that you use is the same measure that will be used against you. So be very careful about the skills that you use of judgment. Come on. Especially where parents are concerned. Come on. Hmm. Get there. And bearing in mind that some of us have just started being parents, yeah. you know, you don't need to wait for a day when judgment will come. Judgment is now. Hey! You're preaching. So if you're waiting for, for some time in the future whereby you will sanitize yourself of all the wrongs you're doing, my friend, you're in for trouble. So let's celebrate our parents. Okay? Yeah. Um... I don't think there's any point of me repeating the scriptures that I've read. You know Psalms chapter 4 verse 3, I'll not read that. 
you also remember um, Romans, uh, it was what, Ro Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And then there was also that other scripture in the Corinthians, the first Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Now the scripture that I want us to read today, because all these scriptures are, 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 are interrelated, is Romans chapter 8 from verse 28 to 30. Romans chapter 8 from verse 28 to, to 30. Karomo, Romans chapter 8 from verse 28 to 30. I think I'll just read so that uh, for, for, for the purposes of my own uh, sobriety. I'm reading from uh, the King James Version Karomo, but I'll remain sober. Okay. All right. Um, okay, let me read from the one that I have here. You know, I realize that there are different variations of King James these days. There is also King James of, of 2000. It was a bit funny. It's okay. Let me read the one that I, I like most. The one that King James of England <laughs> declared with authority in the year 1611. As if I lived during that time. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love, the, uh, love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine predestinate rather, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. More, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and I bless you. I give you praise, I give you glory and honor, thanking you, Father, for the ministry of your word. Lord, I pray for utterance, I pray for grace, I also pray for wisdom to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. And I pray, Father, for these brethren, as well as also those who are streaming from wherever they are, that there is going to be understanding of the things that I am going to articulate this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, believing and trusting. Amen and amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, part five, the mystery of consecration. Uh, for those of us who are joining us for the first time, we've been doing a series on the mystery of consecration. And I begin by submitting to us that consecration is what causes you to embrace your identity in order that you may be able to pursue your destiny. Uh -huh. If you're thinking about destiny, if you're hoping to come to a place whereby you'll fulfill your purpose, if you're hoping that you'll come to a place whereby you'll actualize your dreams and goals, then you need to consider consecration. Mm -hmm. Remember, beloved, you cannot be able to actualize your destiny devoid of your identity. Yeah, and beloved, you cannot be able to walk in the fullness of your identity without consecration. It is only at the place of consecration that we are able to embrace our identity. Hallelujah. Because your identity is a reservoir of the divine power that God has invested inside of you so that you may become whatsoever he has ordained you to become, beloved. Yes. And you know, beloved, when you do not have the ability to actualize the power of your identity, then you have no destiny. Hey. You cannot be able to, 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 to embrace your destiny. It is not possible. And, and you know, the New Testament life, as opposed to the Old Testament life, it is a very unique life. This is a life which is higher and has more demands 
that have been placed on it in aspects of responsibility. Uh -huh. One good thing about the New Testament, as opposed to the Old Testament, is that the New Testament has got no laws. Okay? It has got no laws regarding the life of the new creation man. The New Testament is a very, very uh, unique testament because you, you realize one thing, that uh, when Jesus Christ came, he inaugurated a new covenant. Yes. The Bible says that this new covenant is founded on better promises. Yes. His blood speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. Yes. 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 Now, in the, new, uh, in, in the new creation that we all are in, that is if at all you are, because I'm not so sure, you must know that the man of the new creation does not need the law because he is the law. The new creation man is Christ Jesus. And we are all partakers. We have a portion in the new creation man. You see, God did not originally design the earth to be ruled by the knowledge of good and evil. Come on, come on! Hey! Hello? God designed the earth to be ruled by the very life of God. Come on! Now, the very life of God is what we read in the Genesis account as the tree of life. Hallelujah. That was basically what God had. God had, I mean, when, when God made man, he had never intended that we be ruled by do's and don'ts. We were supposed to be governed by life. Yes! And as long as you have the life of God in you, then you do not need any other law. That is why the, the Bible says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Because in Christ there is therefore no more condemnation. Because we no longer walk after the flesh but after the spirit. Hello? Now, if you consider a character in the, in, in the Old Testament such as David... You see, David was anointed by Samuel as king. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is that David did not become a king immediately. Yes. David had a long journey, a very long, difficult journey. He had a, he had a long journey of facing battles. Yes. David had a long journey of facing difficulties. He had a long journey of facing temptations, yes. trials. You know, he had to dodge Saul several times because Saul was after his life. Uh -huh. Remember David, even as a teenager, he had to face Goliath. Yes. Okay? Uh -huh. Of course, he had to face the bear and the lion before facing the Goliath. Yeah. The guy had to live a life of survival for approximately 17 years before he ascended the throne. Uh -huh. Yet he had been anointed as a teenager, as king. You get what I'm saying? Yes. That is to tell you, beloved, that it doesn't matter what God has spoken concerning your life. Yes, God may have spoken about greatness, but remember there is a journey. And that journey is a journey of dealings. Yes. God has to take you through depths and breadth and heights of dealings so that the things that are vested within you that, that, that do not correspond with your identity, things that would not usher you into your destiny, God has to take you through dealings and after the dealings are over, you are now consecrated yeah. for the designation that is calling you. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, friends, God created man in his image and after his likeness. But understand that since God is spirit, Whatever he creates is still spiritual. Yes. God does not create anything physical. Read your Bible very well. God is spirit and the things of God are spirit. But it is what he forms that becomes physical. You see, in the, in the, in the first chapter of Genesis, you are aware of the fact that the Bible says in, in the 26th verse, Whereby he says, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. Now that man was not just any other ordinary man. That was a prototype. Yeah. But in the, in, 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 the, in the second chapter of Genesis, we read that God formed man from the dust of the ground. Hey! It is whatsoever that God forms that becomes visible. But whatsoever that God creates is spiritual. Okay? Yeah. You see, everything that we read... In the first chapter of Genesis, in matters of creation, was spiritual. Hey! Formation started 
in from chapter 2. That is where we read about the fact that God decided to plant a garden in the east of Eden. Then whatsoever he created in the first chapter, what he did is that he transported them into the garden. Come on! Hello? Hello? You must understand that there, you know, there, are, there are some things that we read in scripture. They were created before they were formed, man being one of them. Okay? This is a hard truth. The man that the Bible refers to in Genesis chapter 1, from verse 26, all the way going down, that man was not Adam. Because there's no name of Adam in chapter 1. It talks of man. That man was a prototype. We read about Adam in chapter 2. And what, and what is the difference between Adam and the man that we read in, 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 chapter, in, in, in chapter 1 of Genesis? Adam was formed. He was the man who was formed from the dust of the ground. And of course the Bible says God decided to breathe the breath of life into his body and he became a living soul. When man fell, he became a living being. A human being rather, sorry. Okay? So Adam was formed in chapter 2. He was not created. All right? Because the created man that we read about in scripture, this is the prototype. This is God's image as well as also his likeness. All right? Now the formed man is the one who was Adam himself. He was, at that time, he was not in God's image and after his likeness. And I'm going to prove that in a few. Because, you know, friends, if Adam had been the case, then he would fit perfectly into the description that we read about in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. All right? So Adam is not the image and likeness of God because, you know, he had not been consecrated. All right? Now, Adam was supposed to become the image and likeness of God by the choice he made. Not by act of creation. Ah, ah. All right? Now, this choice was supposed to be dispensed through the import of his will. Come on. All right? Yes. And, and one thing we must know about God is that God will forever respect the choices of man. When Adam made a choice of heeding to whatever his wife asked him to do, to partake of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we know very well what happened. It was by choice. You get what I'm saying? And everything that Adam did on the garden, even before the fall, was largely dependent on his choice, not by the choice of Jehovah God. Okay? Even when he was speaking and giving names to the animals, he did so by an act of choice. The words that Adam spoke to the animals was basically words of creation. He was creating them, or rather consecrating them, if I may put it that way to be able to be aligned to God's prophetic purpose. Okay? He, in other words, Adam was basically giving definition of each and everything so that they should become what they ought to be. Is somebody getting me what I'm saying? Yes, Bishop. Understand that whereas that was going on, God was basically using Adam to prepare a, an, an environment whereby he too will also enter into consecration but by an act of choice, all right? Because remember, he was still in that state of formation, but he had not entered into the place of creation. Now, you see, beloved, Adam would have actually been the created man if he had taken the right decision by the import of his will. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay? Yeah. And you know, friends, God will only consecrate the obedience that is born of faith in Christ. Hey! That's the truth of the matter. God will use the obedience that is born of faith to fulfill his divine purpose. God will never consecrate any obedience that is born of faith in rituals, in programs, as well as in performance. And this is a harsh rebuke to people who minister in the house of God. Yes. You see, I thank God for talent. I thank God for giftings and natural abilities. We, 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 we are a church that believes in celebrating talent, giftings, and natural abilities. But understand, beloved, at the end of the day, if your obedience is born in faith in your, in your purported gifting, talent, and abilities, then you cannot be consecrated for divine purpose. Hey! That's the truth of the matter. 
Your faith should stem out of obedience. Obedience unto God's will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your faith is supposed to be that kind of faith that is in the word of God and in the voice of God. God has no use for any false obedience that is born of false faith. Okay? You understand what I'm saying, church? Yeah. You know, in Exodus chapter 29, from verse 44 to 46, I'll just read, you don't need to refer. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and and be their God, they will know that I, I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Now understand this, beloved. God is the one who consecrates a church. God is the one who consecrates a fellowship. Yeah. I cannot consecrate a church. Mm -hmm. I cannot consecrate a congregation. Conse you see, the workings of, of consecration insofar as a, as a body of believers such as, such as ourselves, that is within the province of God. And understand, beloved, God's act of consecration is not a response to the rituals that we make every Sunday. Hey! Okay? Come on! We can come up with all manner of rituals and liturgy whereby we perform within ourselves and also of ourselves. But at the end of the day, beloved, God will never consecrate that. He will not. You see, God consecrates because of one thing. He consecrates us so that we may be able to bear fruit. All right? And fruit comes from the obedience that comes from faith in him. And beloved, any obedience that does not come from faith is a ritual. Is being ritualistic. You know, whenever you come into God's presence, you must understand that how God moved in the past does not mean that he, that's the same way he's going to move. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yes. Especially for those of us who minister at the place of the altar, at the place of worship. You see, how, how praise and worship was done last Sunday is not the way it ought to be done today. Are we together? Yes. How the instruments were played, especially for those of you who are instrumentalists. Now, I know sometimes you're very keen about key, and of course, if you play in the wrong key, I'll have a problem with you. I'll just give you that bishopric look, and that alone will speak volumes. But at the end of the day, understand this. It is not so much about your skill that really matters to God more than your heart and your willingness to obey him. Because, you know, there are times, you know, we are very keen about things that God does not even take very seriously. Things that don't even matter to him. So in the process, you miss out on the flow. I have seen instrumentalists who are very talented, playing skillfully, but they are, out, they, they are not in the spirit. And you find that such an instrumentalist becomes a stumbling block to the vocalists. Just in the same way, you'll find that you can have vocalists who know how to sing, okay? They know how to sing, but they do not know how to sing in the spirit. And yet you find that there's an instrumentalist who is able to play an instrument in the spirit. And that is why it's important that we, whenever we are in worship, we learn the importance of ministering unto the Lord and ministering unto each other. And this is not just for worship, for each and every department in a church such as ours. You know, friends... God does not butter favors for our rituals, programs, and performances. He has no time for that, beloved. He does not trade favors because of how ritualistic we are. Okay? You must understand, beloved, when God consecrates, what, what he's basically doing is that he wants to make us holy. He wants to set us apart for his divine purposes. And you know, the divine purpose that God has in the world today is to reconcile the world to himself through the gospel. He wants to fill the earth with his glory in Jesus' name through the church. And beloved, the mechanics of God's divine purpose being fulfilled is him dwelling among us. He wants to be our God and he wants us, us to be his people. And he wants us to come to the place whereby we are able 
to capture the revelation of his person as well as also his nature so that we know that indeed we are his people. And that is why, beloved, true obedience is the result of faith in Christ alone. True obedience is not the result of rituals, programs, and performances. It is not the result of talent, giftings, and natural abilities. Because such kind of obedience, like I said earlier on, is actually false. Okay? It is a kind of faith that, that thrives so much in programs, in performances, and every other kind of a thing. Because you're used to things being done in a particular way. You think that that is how you can cage God. God cannot be caged. Yes. Hello? You cannot cage God, even when it comes to preaching. It's very hard for me to preach the way I preached last Sunday because, beloved, at the end of the day, that was last Sunday. If I tried to imitate how I preached, I'll struggle. There'll be no flow. There will be no flow. How you listened to the word of God last Sunday cannot be the same way as the way you did today. Let's not be, be, be caught up in this temptation to do things the way we've always done and we end up missing the move of God in our lives. Hello? Even when it comes to being prophetic, I can tell you, in, 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 in my growth of, of the prophetic, how I used to hear God years ago is not the way I hear him nowadays. And I can tell you, as one who understands the prophetic, is that God does not speak the same way. God has got various ways through which he speaks. There are times you'll think that you'll hear the voice as loud as a speaker, but God will use your circumstances to speak to you. Have you ever wondered why after, after you fasted and prayed, and you're wondering, why is God not speaking to me? And yet God has already spoken to you through your circumstances. Or God speaks to you through people. Yeah. And some of the people that God may speak to you may not be the kind of people that you might probably take seriously. But because he is God and besides him there is no any other, because he is God and he's not obligated to operate the way you expect him to operate, you must come to the place whereby you submit yourself to his sovereignty. Okay. Or else you'll miss out the voice of God and thereby you'll miss out the season of your consecration. Hello? You're getting what I'm saying, church? You know, from the beginning, God always dwelt in a tabernacle. God has never operated in the realms of humanity without a tabernacle. He has always dwelt in a tabernacle. And that is why the man that we read about in the Genesis account, Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26, that particular man is a prototype of the tabernacle that God would want to dwell amongst members of the human race. Okay? And you see, a tabernacle is not consecrated unless God, or rather until God dwells in it. It doesn't matter how beautiful the tabernacle is. Yes, the tabernacle may be built according to the patterns and designs of God. Yes, that is very true. But friends, you must understand that God must fill the tabernacle. God must dwell in it and he must have ownership over the tabernacle. Then only can that tabernacle be considered as consecrated. And that is why you find that a tabernacle was always anointed as a symbol of God's presence to dwell in. And, 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 and you know why? It's because that tabernacle was supposed to be separated from everything that is common so as to serve God's purpose. Now the Bible says that you and I, we are supposed to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. Now friends, it doesn't matter if at all we are to apply each and every biblical principle that we read about in scripture. Until God anoints us, until he indwells us, we are not yet the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus tells the apostles after his resurrection to tarry in Jerusalem until they are endowed with power from on high. You get what I'm saying? He told them that, you know, until they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they cannot be able to become witnesses unto him. And this is to tell us even in our day that un until we come to the place where we experience 
an infilling of the Spirit of God, we cannot be able to be a people who are consecrated to serve his purpose. There is the overarching purpose of God for us as individuals, but there is also God's purpose in each and every season. So in a season such as this, you must know, you must understand what exactly is God calling you as an individual? What is God calling us as infamy? And how do we come to the place whereby we receive the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God? How is it that we are able to come to a place whereby we are anointed by God so that we may become a tabernacle of His presence to be able to fulfill His purpose in this particular season? Hello? You know, when God owns a tabernacle, when God decides that he wants to reside in a person and makes that person his tabernacle, what happens is that the individual stops living for himself or herself. When God comes into my life, I must know that he does so in order that I may stop living for myself. I begin to live for his purpose. That is what consecration is. Consecration is a process whereby you stop living for yourself and you begin to live for the purpose of God. You begin to live for the ordinations of God in Christ Jesus. Because, beloved, that was the original intention when God created man at the beginning. When he created that man in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, he was creating a prototype. Okay? He was creating a prototype. And he had wanted the man that he formed in chapter 2 to be able... To come to the place whereby after being formed, he becomes created by partaking of the fruit from the tree of life so that he, in turn, may be able to exist forever as one who indwells the presence of God so that Adam would actually come to the place where he exercises dominion. You see, Adam did not know dominion when he was formed. He was supposed to walk in dominion by reason of exercising the capacity of his will to partake of the fruit from the tree of life so that he may live forever. And a person who lives forever is a person who walks in dominion. That was basically the thing. And that is why Eden was basically a type of an office of Christ. Okay? Eden was basically the office of Christ. And Adam was actually designated to function in that particular office, do whatsoever he's supposed to do in anticipation for a moment where he was going to be consecrated by reason of obedience in the voice of God. And it was a very simple instruction that he was given, but he disobeyed God. Hello? You see, God wants us to come to a place whereby when we become his tabernacle, that we are able to walk in the realms and the atmospheres of God. Consecration prepares you to walk in the realms and the atmospheres of God. And you know, friends, there are certain things that you and I will not be able to walk into until we are consecrated. If you, and not only that, until you are able to capture the realms and, and, and the atmospheres of God, there are certain things you cannot embrace. Because most of these things that we desire in our lives, they are actually interconnected with the realms and the atmospheres of God. Hello? Let me, l l let me break it down further because I, I, am, I, I, I notice that people here seem to be floating. They seem not to be understanding what I'm saying. I'm seeing heads are just nodding, but the truth is that you're getting nothing. <laughs> now, you know money in and of itself has no spiritual consequence. Money has no spiritual in and of itself, okay? But once money is configured and consecrated for purpose, it becomes a sacred commodity. You get what I'm saying, church? You see, money in and of itself is not the issue. And there's nothing wrong about money. There is no satanic money. Okay? There is no bloody money. Money is money. Money has no life in, in and of itself. Okay? It has no spiritual capability. It has no power in and of itself. Money must be configured. Money must be consecrated for purpose such that it becomes a sacred commodity. Just like the goblets of the temple. 
that we read about. And the unleavened bread at the altar in the tabernacle. Okay? You know, friends, there, you, 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 you know, there are certain things that we consider to be very ordinary materials. Huh? But remember, once men configure them and consecrate them to a spirit, they stop being ordinary. When you go to a demonic altar and the sorcerer tells you to offer certain things, you must understand that that altar is modulated by the posture of the heart of the sorcerer to a particular spirit to, who, to, to which he or she submits to. So whatever you place on that altar, it ceases to be your own. It becomes something that is, in other words, it is separated from you, it is separated from everything that is common. Hallelujah. You get what I'm saying? Anything that is offered unto God as an offering, it becomes the property of, 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 of certain unseen realities that have capacity to conduct certain transactions within the realms of the spirit. Hallelujah. Whenever we give our tithes, whenever we give our offerings, whenever we give fast foods and every other kind of giving, you must understand that your giving in and of itself that act of giving is a, should be an act of obedience on the strength of the word of God, not on the strength of what you had some other preacher talking about. It should be on the strength of God's word, yeah. such that when you place it at the altar, it, it, what happens is that it becomes a property of unseen entities that have capacity to be able to conduct certain realities in the realms of the spirit. All right? The Ark of the Covenant that we read about in the Old Testament it was made of plywood and sculpture. But the thing is this, it became hallowed by consecration. It did not become hallowed by reason of the fact that Moses ensured that he followed the designs and the patterns. That tells you that, friends, we can do everything that God tells us, but until he indwells us, all our actions are in vain. You get what I'm saying? You can live according to the Bible. You know, there are those ones who believe in the Bible more than the Spirit of God. You worship the scriptures more than the spirit of the scriptures. But at the end of the day, you find yourself struggling. You know? You get what I'm saying? You know, money can be given and what, and, 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 and you see, what appears in the spirit is a monument of worship, of honor, as well as also of obedience. Money is not Kenya shillings when you bring it at the altar. Money is not dollars when you bring it at the altar. It becomes a monument of worship. It becomes a monument of sacrifice. It becomes a monument of obedience. So whenever you give, beloved, don't see your giving in terms of currency. If you see it in terms of currency, you've not given according to the word of God. You've just done what sorcerers do and what other devil worshippers do whenever they go to their temples. Oh, I've given so much money. Well, witches also give money more than you. Hello? They also do. You know, I keep paying my tithes. Well, you think you're the only tither. <laughs> Muslims also pay tithe. Hello? They pay tithe to Allah. But the problem with you is that you do not understand something which is an underlying principle that the Muslims, ha uh, Muslims know. To them, they are not giving money. They are giving a property of an unseen entity. Because, they, they, because what they want is, they want the spirit behind the giving and the spirit that mans the altar or the mosque to grant them the capacity to be able to conduct realities in the realms of the spirit. Hello? You know, even when, when it comes to the sacrifice of bulls and rams, you know, in the days of old, understand this, beloved, Bulls were slaughtered not to get to God as dead animals. They appeared as worship and obedience. Because God does not accept dead animals. God accepts worship. Okay? God accepts obedience. That means it doesn't matter what act you do. 
If it is ritualistic, if your giving is ritualistic, as far as God is concerned, you have brought a dead sacrifice and God does not accept a dead sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says that I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. God accepts a sacrifice which is living. He does not accept something which is dead. Yes, the bull must be slaughtered and offered as a burnt offering. But what is the principle of slaughtering? What is the principle of offering it as a burnt offering? It must appear to God as worship and obedience. That is very important. And that is why, friends, as a person who is consecrated, you know, God consecrates you so that you may minister in his presence and at the same time you are also able to minister to the people of God while you are in the presence of God. You see, the office where you work is supposed to be your altar. God consecrates you so that you may minister unto him and you minister to your boss and your work colleagues while you are in the presence of God. The problem with a lot of employees is that we, we always depart to the presence of God when we leave church. A lot of people in business struggle a lot because they, do not, they forget one thing, that they are supposed to be ministers. They are supposed to be ministers. They, you know, you must have that, uh, you know, consciousness that even when you're about to strike a deal, my friend, that environment is supposed to be an atmosphere. An atmosphere that attracts the spirit of God to be present so that that deal will go through. Or else you might end up entering into a deal that will go sour. You get what I'm saying, beloved? You must know that even when you are doing business with people, see yourself as a minister unto God. See yourself as though you are ministering to God and you are ministering to your fellow to, 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 to your fellow businessman or businesswoman. Okay? And you are doing so within the sanctity of God's presence. Don't be holier than thou in church and then when you leave church you become like any other person. You live like, you even live worse than an unbeliever. Even how you talk to your boss is terrible. Even how you talk to your work colleague is terrible. Even how you talk to your business colleague, it's, it's so bad. You know? And this is one thing that, you know, a lot of non-believers accuse us as believers. We talk so badly. Hmm? We do not understand the importance of consecration. You know, Indians do not just do business just like the, the way you think. Indians consecrate themselves to their gods. That's why in an Indian shop you'll always find there's an altar there and there's an idol there. You may call it foolish, but this guy knows what he's doing. He's invoking a certain unseen reality that would ensure that whatsoever is in your wallet or your bank account must be transacted to that altar. Now here is a case whereby you have never consec consecrated even your own salary unto God and you're taking your money to that Indian shop. What are you basically doing? You're basically, you're indirectly putting yourself in bondage. Because what happens is, your money has got no covering. So you end up claiming that you're a child of God, but your money is busy transacting with a different God. That is why by 15th you're broke. You're looking forward to, to end month. Doesn't that speak about Kenyans? Yes. By 15th, we are broke. We are waiting for end month. And immediately it is end month. Remember, there is that altar that you sacrificed to that Indian shop in River Road. You, 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 you know what happens is the spirits there will show you something that you need, but at that time you didn't have money. So you'll still go back. And you give your money. And indirectly you offer a sacrifice because you do not have, you, you see, you do not have the spirit of God that can counter the repercussions of what you were transacting with that India. Hello? Hello? You've seen how you lose money? Yeah. Because you see, if you tell me that you're a, you're a consecrated person, then the question is, where is your devotion? Where is your devotion? Where is your dedication? Have you set yourself apart for service? And you see, setting yourself is an attitude of the heart. Okay? You must know, beloved, that consecration has to do with a personal commitment unto God, whereby you're committed to his will, whereby you're committed to his, to his service. You're not, you're, 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 not, you're not committed to 
a promise to become something. Because the challenge is, and I remember saying this last Sunday, that people are more committed to becoming apostles, prophets, businessmen, and, and all these things. You want to be a career person. You, you, God gave you a word that you're going to be a lecturer in some university. God gave you a word that you're going to be this and that and that. And you know, beloved, it is true God spoke, but beloved, is that all? Are you just operating on the basis of the fact that God told you that you're going to have your own state-of-the-art uh, auditorium that you'll be hiring out services? Is that all? That God is going to give you gadgets? Beloved, gadgets, gadgets, gadgets every gadget that, you, that, that we purchase... There'll always be a better one. Okay? There'll always be a better camera than Black Magic. Okay? I believe that's a Black Magic. Okay. There'll be a better one, friends. Infamy, there'll be a better one. So if we just thrive in the Black Magic anointing and feel that now, you know, it's all about Black Magic, my friend, you're getting it wrong. There were other cameras that preceded the Black Magic. You get what I'm saying? But there is that which is, of, of the, you know, the will of God that, that surpasses black magic and every other thing that, we are, that we, we are striving for. Because, you know, one thing that I realize is that when you begin to live for the things that God has promised you, you'll never have a life. You'll never have a life. That God is, is ushering you into a business deal. So you begin to live for that particular deal. What about if there's a better deal than the one that God spoke about? God has told you that you're going to have, have a deal of 400,000 US dollars. And you think that that is now the epitome of all deals. And then you, you get to hear of a Freemason who's doing a deal of 800,000. And here you are wondering, how come is it that I'm a child of God and I'm not getting that deal? You begin to bind that Freemason, and the more you bind that Freemason, the more successful he is, because you're operating on a wrong principle. So that tells you that there's something above that. There's something above that. When you consecrate yourself, beloved, unto God, what, that, what, what, what it entails is that you seek the Lord each and every now and then, because, beloved, God is able to do a unique work in us and through us when our lives are consecrated unto him. And beloved, God the Father has a desire to significantly impact others through you and I. And that's why we must look at consecration as not being an act or a feeling, whereby you, you, you are acting on a feeling. Consecration is an act of your will to surrender to Jesus. It's not a feeling. It's not saying that I'm feeling like I want to do something. I feel, I feel I'm being led by God to give away my car. And your car cannot even fetch more than half a million as opposed to that of a person who worships a python whose car can fetch 20M. You see, that's the difference. Consecration is supposed to be a response to God of our, of, 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 whereby we surrender to his will. We don't surrender to God because he has given us promises of things. We surrender to his will. Okay? It's very, very important. You know, for, beloved, when you offer something to God, you relinquish ownership of that item. When you offer money to God, you relinquish ownership of other money. When you offer in any kind of substance unto God, you relinquish ownership over it. Instead, that particular thing that you're offering belongs to God. It belongs to him. And, and, and you see, when you say something belongs to God, it is entirely for his use. It is entirely for his satisfaction. The question that I want to ask is this. Whenever you've given tithes and offerings... Have you really offered, have you relinquished your rights of ownership over your tithes and offerings? When you offer, you know, when, when you say that you, you're offering yourself as a living sacrifice, have you indeed relinquished your will or rather your rights over your life? You know, I realized something. It is very possible for me to give 50,000 shillings as an offering without giving myself to him. 
I can offer a hundred K comfortably and say that you know what I've given to God, but I've not given myself to God. I've not given my heart to God. So as far as God is concerned, I am not consecrated and my 100K is, 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 is of no use. You get what I'm saying? Just the same way, you can exchange vows when you're getting married because you want the certificate, but the truth is you've not, you've, you've not given each other, you've not given your hearts to each other as husband and wife. That is why couples toy around with the institution of matrimony, you know, after a few months, after years, the next thing you begin to, you begin to look for an excuse to get out of the marriage. But you're forgetting what you said. Hmm? Hello? You just exchanged vows with this ring I be wear and with all my worldly goods. My worldly goods includes your body. The first worldly good that you offer to your spouse is your body. Hello? Husband, offer your body to your wife. Wife, offer your body to your husband. No depriving each other. When you deprive each other, my friend, you are wicked, according to the word of God. But Bishop, I am fasting and praying, and I need to be holy for God. But the question is, if you want to fast and pray, and you want to be holy for God, don't you think marriage is holy? What about your vows, or, your, or, are, your, or are your vows unholy? I'm talking to those who are, who are married. Those vows that you made to your husband and wife, eh, Makena, when you, stood, when you stood on the day of your wedding, my dear daughter, you remember you, 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 you stood on my right and your hubby Ethan stood on my left. I remember very well. Were you facing me while exchanging vows? You're facing Ethan, isn't it? Yeah. So did you tell Ethan now, with this ring I be wed, and with all my worldly goods except my body to thee and thou, you committed yourself wholeheartedly unto him, isn't it? So that even if you are fasting, yeah? even if you are fasting, if he decides that he wants to indulge, my friend, you indulge in the fast. Hello? Married people, are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Don't ever tell your spouse, you know what, I need some time, and your spouse is insisting. My friend, you better give in. Your fast will not be defiled because you gave in to your spouse. If it, if it, is, ab, if it, if it is abstaining from sex, it must be mutual. mutual. There must be a mutual agreement. But if the other person feels that... Uh, it, he or she is not feeling this fast and prayer, my friend. When it is time to indulge, even as you're fasting in the Holy Ghost, my friend, indulge in the Holy Ghost, and when you're through, continue on with your fast. That's a Bible. You get what I'm saying? Because a lot of spouses are losing their partners because of the excuse that they are seeking God. How can you be seeking God for three months and, and you're married to a man or to a woman? Eh? You're always seeking God. You want to give the impression to your, to your partner that, he, that, that you know God better than him or her. If you know God, let me tell you, the God that you know will tell you that, that you know what, you are married. There's a need that your spouse needs. Because that spouse has become one and, you know, one with you. Let's not get some things twisted that I need to take time off. Then why did you get married? Why did you get married? You just got married because it was the thing. It was, it was, it, it was a thrillful experience. Then after that, when the dust has settled, that's when you realize that you need to go to Cataloni to pray. <laughs> Are you, going, are you going to pray because you want to sanitize your matrimonial bed? Huh? Those of you who are single, take your time. <laughs> take your time because when you get there, my friend, marriage is curfew. You can't hide. Okay? 
You don't go playing dangerous cards under the table. You, everything must be exposed. All garments must be exposed. Some of you are wondering what I'm saying. You see, beloved, you know, before consecration, understand that your life is for the pursuit of your own goals and satisfaction. But after you're consecrated, you must understand that your life is for the pursuit of God's purpose, whereby you live for his will. And remember, consecration is something that must happen internally before it is externally. You must be separated and dedicated to God in your heart before you can lead a consecrated life on the outside. Hello? You know, many times people have tried to, you know, to, to, to be consecrated first on the outside by trying to modify their behavior before they can be changed on the inside. And you know that is bondage. Consecration is not about modification of behavior. Whereby you don't raise your voice, you want to talk softly. I know of people who talk softly but they are arrogant. That if you raise your voice, you're not being humble. Let me tell you, that in itself is, 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 is arrogance. It is not what you do on the outside. It's not even how you walk. You can walk and keep on genuflecting from one end of the auditorium to, you know, to the other. But that does not mean that because you've genuflected that you are consecrated. You could just be evil. It is evil that is masquerading itself as an angel of light. Hello? Consecration does not change your personality. A sanguine remains a sanguine even when consecrated. A melancholic remains a melancholic even after being consecrated. A choleric the same. But the challenge is, people have this thing of, you know, when you talk in a particular way, you're not, you're not, you're not depicting that you're consecrated. My friend, consecration has nothing to do with that. Okay? When you try to modify your behavior on the outside, what happens is you will bring bondage upon yourself. Because, beloved, you cannot consecrate yourself by outward action only. It's not possible. You cannot be consecrated by keeping certain rules. That you must, if you're a lady, you must wear, you must wear long-sleeved tops. And you must wear trousers which are very extremely loose. Very, very loose. And so on. That if you're a man, you know, it, it would be very wrong for you to wear certain types of trousers. You know, those are just outward forms of, of, of our lives. But that does not depict an inward uh, reality within the heart. Because, beloved, you cannot be consecrated by avoiding certain behaviors. Okay? Because the truth of the matter is, that, is this. If you're used to a certain behavior and you try to avoid it, after some time you'll forget You'll always forget. If you are a loud-mouthed person who's full of vulgarity, it will just come forth. And you know God knows how to set you up. He gives you a setting whereby you'll just spew out everything. And people will look at you, those ones of, okay, one minute you were in the Holy Ghost. Then the next thing, what was going on? Or was there an unholy ghost in you or what was going on within your life? And some people are very unholy. Okay. You know, in certain religious uh, circles, you'll find that people cannot do certain things. You cannot dance, you cannot go to the movies, you cannot wear makeup and so on, because you know what they, what, 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 what they are basically doing is that they want you to be consecrated by outward works. But the truth is that outward works will never work in your life. What, what it does is that it will just turn you away from God. And we are a church that does not dwell on such kind of things. Because what's the point of me telling, you, telling the ladies to avoid makeup and yet their hearts are dirty? You have a dirty heart, but, you, but you're not wearing makeup. Hello? You're a man, and, and we tell you that in this church we do not allow dreadlocks. I tell Roger that, you know what, those dreadlocks, they don't show like you are uh, consecrated and so on. And then Roger shaves the dreadlocks. But within his heart, within the sanctum of Roger's heart, he is evil. 
Consecration is not on the outside. Consecration begins from within. It has to start from within. If it doesn't start from within, everything else that we are doing is in vain. That's the truth of the matter. You know? Because you see, a lot of times, you know, people have uh, distorted what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 from verse 3 to 4. Whereby the adornment should not be merely external. Well, it's, it, it, what Peter is actually telling us here is that he's not trying to dispute that we should not have externalities in matters of adornment. He's, he's placing a, a, a great emphasis that we should actually work on the inside of us. But it, was, it had nothing to do with people being told not to wear makeups and all these other things. That is a distortion of scripture. You know? You know, friends, yes, it is true that there are certain things that as believers we must refrain ourselves from doing. But remember, beloved, our hearts must be transformed in order for lasting change in our lifestyle. If there's no transformation in your heart, there'll be no lasting change. If you want to be a kind of person who lives for God, then you must allow transformation. Now, how does one get transformed? Paul gives us a very, very simple antidote in, 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 in verse 2, I believe verse 2 going down of Romans chapter 12. He says, be ye transformed by the renewal of the mind. You see, when he says, do not conform to the world, he's basically saying, do not conform to the systems and the patterns of the world. Okay? There's a certain system that governs this Babylonian kind of uh, 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 world that we're in. So he's telling us not to conform, but, he's, but he tells us, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The mind must be renewed by the word of God. Now, when I talk about the word of God, I'm not just talking about the letter of the word, I'm also talking about the spirit of the word. In other words, you need the spirit of God to enable you to know how is it that you're able to capture the mind of Christ. So that your mind is set on things above and not things below. And thereby you experience a transformation from your heart. That enables you now to know what is the will of God. The good, the acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. That's very important. So there must be transformation within our spirit. And that's why consecration has a lot to do with internal uh, workings of, 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 of God within us. And the truth is this, beloved. Whenever there is change that happens internally, it will always show on the outside. It will always show. You don't need to fake it. Even in, in, in your personality, it will show. Even if people have no need to be a joker, people will know that there is change. Change does not come because you've changed your voice. Change does not come because you've changed your attire. Change does not come because you've, changed, you've, you've put on makeup and you've even bleached your skin such that you look pink. Change comes because there's something that has happened within the inside of you. And the good thing, beloved, is that the Spirit of God will always speak to our hearts to show us areas that need to be adjusted. And your responsibility is to listen and obey, not to question. The problem is many times even when God speaks to us, we do not listen, we do not obey him. Yet we want God to take us to, to, to a place where we'll, we'll, we'll fulfill our purpose. And you see, beloved, consecration is an inward process that results in an outward change. And that process is preceded by dealings. Okay? God has to deal with you. He has to take you through a journey whereby he, he, he refrains you from certain things that he's allowing other people to do. You get what I'm saying, Eddie? Things that he tells you, you as Eddie, you must not do, but he allows me to do them. So you don't come and tell me that, why, Bishop, are you doing this? Because God told me that I should not do this. He told you, he never told me. Hello? You remember me telling you that I personally don't, uh, do, do, do not like pork, okay? But it's not that God told me not to abstain from pork, so don't, so, so don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying, for instance, if the Lord told me not to take pork, he never told the rest of you not to take pork. If you like to eat anguro, go ahead. But I'm not taking pork, Okay? All right? 
You get what I'm saying? If God has told you to change your hairstyle and you're a lady, you change it as an individual. Okay? Because, you know, sometimes it's, 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 you know, believers are very funny. You do not want people to dress in a particular way because you cannot afford. You know, I was in a church where I used to see how ladies used to fight each other. And I realized after some time of observing them, the ones who are criticizing those who are dressed in a particular way, it was because they didn't have money to afford what these others were wearing. It was not about the fact that they were dressed in a devilish way. If you cannot afford something, you cannot afford it. Don't, don't, don't try to bring in scripture. Don't sanitize your mode of dressing. Hello? It's true. You know, people have so much issues about artificial intelligence. I had somebody say something about it, and I listened, I listened, and I said, you know what, this guy is very, uh, very ignorant. It is dangerous to talk about matters of technology when you've not done your research well. He said that artificial intelligence is a type of 666. I said, huh? <laughs> and the person who's talking about this does not even own a comp. Has never, gone to a, has never done the basic language of computer programming, that AI is devilish. Hello? You know, people, let me tell you something. You are going to hear people say all manner of things. Hmm? You know, science in and of itself is not, a, is not the issue, but it is the misuse of science that becomes a problem. There's nothing wrong with science. There's nothing wrong learning these things, my friends. If you have the opportunity to study AI, go ahead. But be very careful what your motive is. Yeah. Don't go to places whereby people tell you, don't study this, don't do that. There was even another one I remember in a meeting, <laughs> he was criticizing, uh, uh, he, he, was, he was basically criticizing economics. He was saying that economics in and of itself what it does, it, it destroys people, it has destroyed nations, so on and so forth. And I asked him a simple question, have you ever sat in an economics class, live alone even in, in the university, even in high school? He said no, he, 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 he decided not to do it. Then I asked him what was his level of education, he told me that um, he's only reached all levels. So I wondered, okay, I thought maybe if he had done a levels, whereby you do MGCon, it would make sense. You know what I mean by MGCon? Okay. Math, geography, and economics. Friends, one man's meat is another man's poison. Okay? What works for you only works for you, does not work for me. And please don't bring it. Don't even try to export it because I'm not going to buy it. Okay? Just the same way you should not allow me to import something that, that is not consistent with who you are. You see, Jesus has accepted all of us regardless of as to where we've come from. Okay? And how we are consecrated depends on the purpose as to why we are being consecrated at a personal level. Even as a community, beloved, you must know that there are things that we'll never do that other communities are doing. That does not mean that we condemn other, uh, other, other, other church communities. We have our own way of doing things and we are not apologetic. All right? The number of times, you know, I've had ministers of God who watch our live stream trying to share things. You can tell that this is a criticism, but in a very subtle way. And I always shoot it down. Shoot it down very fast. Mm -hmm. I remember there was this pastor who was, I, I, think, I think his intentions were not bad. He was trying to advise me on how to, to talk to the ladies who are in the worship team in matters of dressing and so on. Then I asked him, and what is your problem? Then he said, you know, it can stumble some brothers who are watching. I told him, you are the one being stumbled, not any other brother. 
that it is not good and so on. I told him, no, you are the one being stumbled. I don't have a problem and, I've, and I'm not being stumbled and I'm their bishop. You know? What I told him is that if I were to bring them to your church, I will tell them not to dress the way they dress on my pulpit. So that you don't get stumbled. That is different. But when it comes to my pulpit, I'm the one in charge. Hello? Now, ladies, I'm not now giving you a license now to go to the extreme. <laughs> so don't give me that look of now Bishop has given us a permission to do everything we want. No, I've not said so, you know. God wants you to be a full-fledged believer, not a half-fledged believer. He wants you to be a full-fledged believer. A believer who understands that it is possible for you to live a life of holiness and righteousness even in an environment where there's a lot of judgment. The other thing is that even as we talk about consecration, let's also avoid the temptation to be people who exhibit harsh judgment against other people. And the moment when you use your holiness and your righteousness as a basis to become judgmental, it ceases to be holy. All right, church? Because such kind of judgment does not even honor God in any way. You know, righteousness and holiness should not be expressed in ways that harm other people. Okay? You get what I'm saying? You do not force your will upon a person. But you should allow someone to, to, you know, to gravitate towards the very, very essence as to what truth is and allow the Spirit of God to work in such an individual. I've been in instances where I've dealt with people who, you know, they join a church community. And uh, yes, they are believers, but there are certain struggles they have. So what we do, we just leave them alone to continue on in their struggles. And then at some point, they just make a decisive decision to change. And in fact, I want to submit to you, a time will come where there will be a generation of guys who will not conform to necessarily the things that we do. The question is, are you going to give up on them? Or are you going to know how to handle them? Some of these guys are not going to be spirit-filled the way you want. Being spirit-filled, beloved, is, 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 is an act of one's will. You, you hear what I'm saying? They'll not even be able to understand how is it that you're able to lead praise and worship in tongues. Yet God wants them to be around. Or will you dismiss them and tell them, good for nothing, you are full of the devil, you need to be spiritual, you know, you know that kind of a thing. You have to know how to culture these guys. And that's why we have those uh, core groups that we've actually established. We have foundation class where things are broken down, you know. I think I should attend one of these foundation classes to see what is being taught, to see whether, uh, whether standards have gone down or not. I just need to, to find out. I want to, to touch base with these guys who pretend to be very quiet, in the, maybe are very noisy and questioning the facilitators. I want to be there when you're questioning, so I just look at you, you know, and then I'll just say hello and then just to announce my presence and then I log out. You know? God wants us to, to, to be very careful about the kinds of attitudes that we exhibit all under the auspices of holiness because that in and of itself does not depict an act of consecration. You see, beloved, it's very, very uh, important for us to come to a point whereby we reflect the humility of God as reflected in Christ Jesus so that we avoid the, 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 the temptation to misrepresent what consecration is, especially when you're dealing with people, okay? Because look at it this way. You know, true holiness is not even reflected in how you attend church. Okay? Holiness does not even reflect in your stand on political matters. Azimio followers, UDA followers, I hope you're hearing me. That you've taken a particular stand politically, does not mean that you're much more holier than those who've taken a different, different opinion. Because as far as God is concerned, he's given us a freedom of choice in matters of politics. Even in matters of social, economical challenges that we see in, 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 in society today. 
It's very, very important. Holiness is not measured by the amount of money that you place in an offering bag. Okay? Neither is it reflected by how many Bible verses you can recite by a memory, including the possibility of you reciting the commas, the exclamation marks, the semicolons, and so on. You get what I'm saying? That is not holiness. And it doesn't in any way depict that you're consecrated. Because true holiness is a life whereby you please God at all levels possible. Okay? Whereby you live in service to those that Jesus considers to be the least of these. You know, a consecrated life is a life of an individual who cares for orphans, who cares for widows, who cares for the poor. Because it's dangerous as a church for us to be more concerned about things that we want, but we forget about those who are needy. You know, because in, in any case, we must understand that if, if we are going to live a life of consecration, then we must stand out as a people who operate differently from every other person who's, crit who's critical of those who are in society. That's very, very important. True holiness and righteousness within the construct of consecration, it has a lot to do with a process whereby you're also able to be accommodative of strangers, infamy. One thing that I worry about infamy is this, whenever visitors come, how do you treat them? You know the challenge with this community is that people tend to be very cliquey. We like our cliques. Eh? So visitors come and we ignore them. Especially when we go to the cafeteria. How do you accommodate people who are new in your midst? Well, of course, there are people, you, you see, there are those people who are new who may not probably be that kind, they, they may not be very welcoming. And of course, some of them have never been even until today, but it's okay. But we still love them. The question is, do we give up on them? We don't give up on them. Because if you start giving up on people so fast, then the question is, then how will they be able to know that Christ loves them? You know, you, you know let me tell you, some of the people that you find in a congregation are such as who are very difficult, they're not difficult because they love being difficult. They're difficult because people out there gave up on them. It's true. The parents gave up on them. The uncles gave up on them. The siblings gave up on them. Their bosses have already given up on them. Okay. Even the prospective business partner has already given up on them even before the deal has been settled. So by the time when they come to church, they expect hope. Hello? Some got a word about ministry, but because of their many mistakes, they've actually reached a point whereby they've given up. So what do we do for such people? We must create an environment where they, they begin to realize that there is hope for them. Serious, serious hope. You get what I'm saying? 